Hello, brothers and sisters, and welcome to another time of Bible teaching. The fig tree generation. Let's take a fresh new look at the fig tree generation. Now, I've done several videos about this, um, but I still keep getting questions about the fig tree generation. People st try to wrap it and figure out how does it fit into the the where we're at today. How does it fit into 19, excuse me, 2024, 2031, 2032, 2028, whatever. That's, they're trying to figure out how does it fit in. Um, it does fit, and it fits quite easily and quite well. The problem is the understanding that we've had for so long is not exactly correct. And, you know, I felt, I, you know, I believe, you know, the, the fig tree generation as it's been taught for some time. But sometimes things just don't mean what they think we mean. And we build these understandings of prophecy that this prophecy means this, and you try to wrap everything around that. But what if this that you're wrapping everything around is wrong? Then it messes everything up. Give me, before we start on the fig tree, let me give you an example of this. Open up your Bible. We're going to go to Matthew 24, where the fig tree generation is, and we want to look at something else that Messiah said there. So we're going to go to Matthew 24 and look at a uh, little phrase in verse 22. Except those days be shortened, there should be no flood. I'm sorry. There should. Oh, let me change this. Sorry. Somebody's going to get upset. I'm changing the King James Version. There is no such thing as an infallible version of the Bible. If you think there's an infallible version of the Bible, there's one word that's always translated wrong. In Matthew 25, where it talks about the. Uh, the parable of the ten virgins and the bridegroom comes at midnight. That word is mitz, the time between two days. In 1600s um, England, that's midnight. In Genesis, it's evening twilight, where Paul tells us that the last trump in a twinkling of an eye, an idiom for evening twilight, that's when the rapture happens. It's not midnight. Anyhow, um... Matthew 24, 22. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Who are the elect? Someone that's made an election for Messiah, somebody who belongs to him. And during tribulation, we see it's somebody that has a testimony for Jesus and follows the commandments of God. Um, anyhow, so this verse I've seen people wrap around so many different ways, trying to shorten tribulation. Oh my goodness, I saw one guy try to do it down to six months. The problem is, you've got other scriptures, times, times, and half a times, three and a half years, 1,260 days, describing halves of tribulation. There's no way you can actually shorten those numbers of days, but this tells you it's going to be shortened, right? Maybe there's another answer, and there is. But you have to go back to Amos to see it. So let's do that. Let's go to Amos chapter 8. Verse 9. And it shall come to pass in that day, what's in that day, that's the last day, the seventh day, the day of the Lord, that last 1,000 year period, remember six days you work, one day you rest, a Sabbath, that's a template. Six year, okay, you don't have to work six days, you can work six days. Six years you can work the land, one year the land gets a Sabbath rest. 6,000 years were on earth, and there is a 1,000 period that starts the millennial kingdom that starts with the rapture and tribulation. That's the last day. So when you see in that day, that's the day it's talking about. It could be when the new heavens and new earth start. It could, excuse me. It can be the rapture. It's in that time frame. So it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord God, that I will make the sun go down in noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. 
he shortens the days. It's not the number of days. He didn't say I'm going to shorten the numbers of days, but the amount of daylight in a day gets shortened. This might be very helpful. I forget what verse it is. I think it's Revelation 9. No, it's going to be beyond 9. Give me a second. Let me think. 16. Here it is. Then the fourth angel poured out the bowl on the sun and was given to him to, I'm sorry, and, given, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat. And they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent to get, and give him glory. The purpose of these judgments is always to bring people to repentance. By the end of tribulation, there is nobody left that's willing to repent. And that's when Armageddon comes. So we see that if the sun is going to be given power to scorch men. So we can see where if the sun goes down at noon, that's going to be a real blessing. Wow. Okay. Um, real quick, I did say something. Um, let me see. I just want to show you this. I'll go to, actually, let's go to Revelation 12 real quick. Give me a second here. Give me a second. Yeah, it's at the very end of Revelation 12. Basically, Satan's cast down in heaven. The woman who is Israel has been sent to Petra where he can't get to her, where she's going to be fed and protected for times, times, and half a times. That's the remnant of Israel, the one-third. So it says that the dragon was enraged with the woman, verse 17, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. It is both. We'll see this another time. With the word saints. Give me a second. Here we go. Here are the pa Revelation 14, 12. Here are the patience of the saints. The saints are those that belong to Messiah, the elect, those that have made an election for him. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus twofold. Anyhow, let's get on to the fig tree. So here's the basic premise of the fig tree. Go to Matthew 24, and I'm going to do this part really quickly because you guys know it. This has been taught, and everybody's been talking about this for so long. Um, notice it says immediately after tribulation. Okay, so, so what's before it goes all the way to the seven years of tribulation, and at the end of tribulation. Now learn this lesson from the pig, fig tree. When its branch has already become tem tender and it puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all of these things, everything that was talked about before, when you see all of these things, you know it is near and at the door. Surely I say to you that this generation will not pass until all these things take place. And the heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So now we need a definition of a generation, because this generation is going to see everything up till the end of tribulations. We need a definition of of how long a generation is. Now, a generation, biblically, is 40 years. But that doesn't mean that's how long a generation lives. You know, you think baby boomers, generation X, generation Y, Z, whatever. They're not, those generations are not the entire lifespan of the generation. So we're looking at two different things. We want the lifespan of a generation. And that is found in Psalms 90, verse 10. Oh, it's not 10, is it? We'll see it. We'll see in a minute. There we go. Oh. Psalm 90. Yeah, it is 10. The days of our lives are 70 years. If by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. Birth pains! For it is soon cut off and we fly away. All right. 
So you do the math. 1948 plus 80 years, the furthest this generation can go, 80 years, and you subtract seven. That takes you to 2021. All right, let's stretch it out. You know, it could be the entire year. You know, she turned uh, 80 on, when, when, did, when did Israel become a nation? May 14th. So you could stretch it out and go to May 14th in 2022 to get the entire end of that, that year. There's actually a problem with that. If you count biblically, you don't count on a pagan Roman calendar. You count on God's calendar. And I'm not going to go back and convert the years and you know do this on God's calendar with year 57, 58, whatever it would be. It's real easy to, to convert them. The, the, the end of tribulation is Armageddon, is Armageddon, which is Yom Kippur. If you don't understand what I just said, you need to understand the feast days. And if Paul was here, he'd have to write you a letter so that you understand the feast days. Because to understand anything Paul had to say about the rapture and everything, you got to understand the appointed time of the Lord. I'm not going to dwell on that right now. A lot of people out there understand what I'm getting at. Um, Army, uh, the Jewish calendar, the, the, the beginning of years, not the beginning of months, not the new year for months, which is Nisan, but the beginning of years in Jubilee. The new year for years in Jubilee is Tishri 1 in the fall. So the year of April, May 14th, what we know as May 14th, would have started like in September the year before. So you actually have to subtract the year from that. So that even makes it harder to make this work. So what's the answer? Let's look closer at the fig tree. Because the answer is in the fig tree. So we're going to run through a number of verses about the fig tree. All right. So give me a second. Oh, and it gets worse than that and harder to figure out. Because there's something hidden in this scripture in Psalm 90.10. To see for it is soon cut off. Let's look at that word cut off. To pass over, pass away, to pass away as life, a primitive root properly to shear off, but used only in the figurative sense of passing rapidly, bring cut off. It means you don't go to the 90 years. It doesn't last that long. That makes it even harder, but it's not. It's actually very simple. So let's dig into the fig tree. First of all, I just want to show you something that's interesting. Um, well, a couple of things. The fig tree is definitely Israel. Go to Hosea 9.10. Because you know what? I know people who started when it didn't, the rapture didn't happen based on how they saw the fig tree. Um, they started questioning whether or not it's a pre-trib rapture. Um, I've seen people questioning all kinds of things. Because their understanding of the fig tree was a pillar of their understanding, and they're wrapping all the other scriptures around it. You can't take one or two scriptures. You've got to look at all the scriptures. You've got to understand the fig tree. Um, so we're going to Hosea 9.10. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw her, her fathers as first fruits on the fig tree in its first season. Fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It, Israel is the fig tree. What's interesting is you will see the phrase about being under the fig tree in several places. Go to Micah 4. Micah 4, verse 4. But everyone shall sit under his vine under his fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. Lord of hosts, end times prophecy. Look at the verse before it. He shall judge between the peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation shall not lift up sword again against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. That's the millennial kingdom. Being under the fig tree represents being in the millennial kingdom with Messiah. All right. We see this in Zechariah 3. Verse 10, in that day, says the Lord of hosts, oh, you've got Lord of hosts, that's Messiah coming back as a military general host. That doesn't mean that it's Armageddon. That just tells you it's an end times prophecy. And you see that when you look at all the verses about a Lord of, Lord of hosts. But in that day tells you where it is. Everyone will invite their neighbor under the vine and under his fig tree. All right, we see it one more place in John. Go to John 1. It's nice when you see the same things in the New Testament that are in the Old Testament, and that happens a lot. Uh, 48, but we're probably starting before that. Let's start at 43. The following day, Jesus went up to Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me calling his disciples. And Philip was from Bethsaida, in the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses, I'm sorry, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I can imagine him saying that. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Really? Oh, that place stinks. Really? Can something good come out of there? Philip said, just, just come and see. Forget your preconceived notions. Just come and see. Jesus saw Naz um, Nazareth coming toward him, and he said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, and one whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael says, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, said, Because before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathaniel knew what this meant. Nathaniel answered him and said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him and said, Because I said I saw you under the fig tree. I saw you in my Father's kingdom, in the millennial kingdom. Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see much. You will see greater things than the. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That last verse refers to Jacob's ladder when Jacob wrestled with, with God, had a hip, you know, hip thing, and he saw angels and descending to and from heaven on this ladder. And that event took place at the Temple Mount. Messiah is saying, I am that ladder. That he's going to be ascending and descending on Messiah. All right, so let's look at a few other parables about the fig tree to see what we can see. When it comes to the fig tree, what is Messiah looking for? That's what we want to see in these parables. So let's start with, uh, my, my, I got like chicken scratch for notes. Actually, my chickens get offended. I have chickens. They get offended that I call it chicken scratch because it's that, it's that bad. Sometimes I have trouble reading it. Let's go to Mark 11. And we're looking at verses 13 and 14. And seeing the fig, this is the fig tree that Messiah curses or whatever, and it dies. It's Israel. It doesn't die. It just loses all its leaves or whatever. But it is dead. Um, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. What else would be on it other than leaves? Fruit. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And then they come back and they see that it's dead. See that word season for fruit? Let's look that up. You know, poor fig tree, you know, maybe it had finished producing fruit for the year and it would have produced fruit next year. Why would he kill the poor fig tree? I always thought that. It's kind of weird. Uh, I think our word is here. 
time. Is that it? Yeah, I'm not seeing what I'm looking for. But it's not the season. It's not the right time of the year for it to have figs. That's basically what it means. It's not like it should have had figs. What well, should have? But it also is a measure of time, a larger or smaller, uh, smaller portion of time. Hence, a fixed and definite time when time things are brought to a crisis. Okay, so the point is that this can mean not only is it not the time of the year, but that it is not the time over a lifetime. That Israel is not producing fruit. They are doing, and we and people see this, especially those that are following along in the the book of Matthew. Uh, Israel was lost in so many ways. They didn't understand Messiah. They didn't recognize him when he came. Um, they were making converts, and his Messiah said, you're making them twice the sons of Satan that you are. They weren't bringing people into the kingdom. They were not producing fruit. That's the point. Let's go to Matthew, Luke 3. I'm sorry, Luke 13. Another parable about about uh, about the fig tree. Luke 13, 6 through 9. And he spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. The vineyard is the earth. Okay? It's God's vineyard. It's the Lord's vineyard. But a certain man, Messiah, had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Who was the fig tree? Israel. And he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of the vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and I found none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone. This year also I will dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit well, um, and if it bears fruit well, but if not, after that, you can cut it down. You know, I don't, I, I look, I can't tell exactly, you know, what, what part of the ministry this is for Messiah. I wonder if he's been on earth for three years at this point, because he's not, you're not that far away from the crucifixion at this point. So what is it that Messiah wants from the fig tree? What is it that he wanted from Israel? Fruit. He wants them coming to the Lord and understanding them. And that was the big, two of the biggest pet peeves that Messiah had. Uh, actually, three. One, they didn't get Messiah. They didn't understand Messiah. And they didn't even recognize him because he didn't do things their way. The problem is their way, they were living rabbinical Judaism, which actually got worse after 70 AD, but they were um, adding laws, and actually their laws superseded the laws of God, and even, as Messiah said, transgressed the laws of God. And the other thing is they didn't understand is a Hebraic principle of light and heavy. If two things seem to contradict, which do you follow? The one that's heavier, the one that's more important. This is what allows Pharisees, or, or should I say, um, priests, to work on the Sabbath, because the, the commandment to follow the, the law and to offer sacrifices supersedes not working on the Sabbath. But what are the most important laws? To love God with everything you got and to love others with yourself. That's why if a man is on the Sabbath, is in a synagogue with a withered hand, it's okay to heal that hand. Because that is more important than not working on the Sabbath. Bottom line, Messiah wants fruit. Was Israel producing fruit in 1948? Were there Messianic believers coming to Messiah at that time? Here's a post from something called the Jewish First, Jewish Voice, A History of Messianic Judaism. Uh, it goes down, it's kind of lengthy, um, but let's go to, here we go. Messianic Judaism, Genesis, is intertwined with the Jesus movement of the 1960s. During that revival, many young people with strong ethnic Jewish backgrounds came to faith in Yeshua. 
Um, societal changes of the time offered these Jewish people the freedom to maintain their Jewish heritage and practices while embracing the faith of Jesus as their promised Messiah. The attitude shifted from we're Christians who happen to be Hebrew to we are Jews that believe in Jesus, representing a new mindset that shaped the modern movement for Messianic Judaism. See, that fig tree generation didn't start in 1948 when Israel became a nation. The fig tree generation started probably somewhere in the 1960s when Jews started coming to Messiah. Let's go back and look at the fig tree generation one more time, understanding this, that Messiah wants fruit. Um, we're going back to Matthew 24. See, you'll notice whenever anybody teaches about the fig tree generation, there's one verse they leave out. The first verse. Let me ask you this. Did God, did, did the Lord have a mean old English teacher that made him write up, you know, a uh, 3,274,182 word essay, and he's just trying to fill in. You remember those essays you wrote in English? It had to be 500 words or 5,000 words, and you're adding stuff in just to try to get the word count up? That's not what the scripture is. Every word is important. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And that's probably how they knew summer was near. But the bottom line is, if that fig tree, the branches were becoming tender and it's starting to put forth leaves, it would have already started producing fruit. That's how the fig trees work in Israel. But Israel was, had, even, had not started producing fruit in 1948. So if we start our count um, 15 to 20 years later, there's plenty of time left in the fig tree generation that's going to be cut off and it's not going to go to the 80 years. Anyhow, thank you for watching. May God bless you. Bye-bye.